Okay, I think we've uh, hit the, the noon hour. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, welcome to our first COVID weekly situation report for February 2021. Um, happy Groundhog Day. I understand our Groundhog friends were, were good to us today and are promising an early spring. So um, uh, with that, I'd like, to, oh, first I would like to um, uh, express our thanks for many of our elected officials who are joining us today. Um, I see uh, Chief Carr is, is here with us from Hiawatha First Nation. MPP uh, Dave Smith is also here to join us, as well as MP Miriam Monsef and County Warden Jones and Mayor Tarion. Uh, so uh, to kick us off, I would like to um, offer this land acknowledgement. Uh, that we respectfully acknowledge that Peterborough Public Health is located on the Treaty 20 Michisagic territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagic and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. Peterborough Public Health respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. Okay, so now I would like to invite our board chair, Mayor Andy Mitchell, to uh, start us off with some opening remarks. Please go ahead, Andy. Thanks, Brittany. Dealing with COVID-19 can be challenging. Knowledge of the, of the disease is constantly changing. The data is often complex and approaches can appear contradictory. For example, case counts in Peterborough have declined for each of the last four weeks. However, our January monthly total was at a record high level. Taking a vaccine is an individual choice but that decision has a significant effect on all of us. The disease makes some of us sick, but it has a negative impact on everyone. So what to do? For many in our community, it's simply to carry on. Your actions are making a positive difference. For those who are struggling with the impact, remember, it isn't just about ourselves. Our actions affect our family, our friends, and our community. Progress in slowing case counts should not be mistaken for victory. And remember, you are not alone. If you need help, reach out. We will return to normalcy. We will build back better. And we will hold each other near again. Stay safe. Be well and in all things be kind. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andy, for that. And um, uh, I understand Dr. Salvatera can't see the slides, but we do have a hard copy coming to you. And um, I uh, do have the uh, first slide up for the uh, weekly situation report with a, a screenshot from our COVID tracker. Um, okay. So hopefully that's enough to get you started until the um, the hard copy arrives. Well, I don't need a hard copy, Brittany. I will just uh, trust that you are changing the slides as I speak. I just can't see them. Okay. So, uh, let's begin with a situational update. As of 4.30 p.m. yesterday, we had uh, 33 active cases here in Peterborough. This is 17 less than Friday. The other piece of good news is that um, we started the month of February off yesterday with, with not a single case being reported. And this is the first time uh, since December 14th uh, that that has happened. Uh, just to explain, although our tracker did show two cases yesterday, uh, those were actually from Sunday. We, uh, our provincial system was down on Sunday, uh, so there was a delay in reporting. Uh, as far as today, we've had uh, certainly we've had at least one case reported earlier, so I'm afraid that our case-free uh, streak has already ended. 
In total, we have reported 545 cases since the pandemic began. My team is following 63 close contacts at the moment, 13 less than we reported last Friday. Uh, and it's good to see these numbers are going in the right direction. Uh, we remain at eight local deaths in the community due to COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, what you should be seeing is a, a bar graph that shows the weekly totals and they continue to decline and that's a good sign. We reported 31 new cases last week, but you can certainly see uh, that over the past four weeks uh, together, we have been higher than at any other point in the pandemic. Next slide, please. Now that January has ended, we can compare it to other months. There were 198 cases, clearly showing that this was the month uh, where we had the most virus being spread uh, in our community. I'm hoping that, uh, that, in fact, we are seeing the peak of the second wave here in Peterborough, but with variants of concern now being identified in other parts of the province, our current control of the outbreak remains tenuous. Uh, it's certainly encouraging though, to see our efforts having an, uh, an effect, uh, but we certainly have a long way to go before this is over. Next slide, please. Uh, we should be looking at exposures here and the sources of exposure remain consistent as they have uh, for the past several weeks. Uh, we are now showing that 68% of our cases are a result of a close contact uh, and community spread uh, represents almost 23% of our cases. I wish to thank our case and contact management team for their incredible efforts in tracking down contacts and helping them to proactively contain the virus uh, once a positive case has been identified. Of course, all of this is dependent on the public. So uh, thank you everyone for your cooperation. The next slide should be on our testing status. We last reported a week ago on this. Uh, since then, another 450 residents have been tested in Peterborough, and that brings our total to approximately 41,600 residents, or 28% of our local population that's been tested at least once. The next slide uh, should be uh, on our outbreaks. We currently have three active outbreaks and that's one less than last Friday because the outbreak at uh, Centennial Place in Millbrook was declared over. Uh, we are hoping that the outbreak at Regency can be declared over this week uh, if there is no uh, further evidence of virus transmission. We'll look at our map of case incidence rates, uh, and that's per 100,000. Uh, our rate is standing, our cumulative rate is at 369 since the pandemic began, uh, which is why our area is shown in orange. But please note that this is not the same color coding system um, that was used earlier uh, for the province uh, and before we went into uh, uh, shutdown. Uh, our case incidence rate uh, for the past week is has declined to 22 cases per 100,000. That's almost half the weekly rate of uh, 47, which was at our peak in the week of December 28th to January 4th. Um, if we were back in the uh, previous provincial framework, uh, we would be uh, back in yellow or the protect zone. So again, I think that shows that people in Peterborough are taking this seriously and that they are uh, cooperating with these public health measures. 
So um, I'd like to provide an update on the local vaccine rollout that continues here in Peterborough. We have enough doses uh, left from last week to complete one more long-term care home. So our staff are vaccinating the residents of Springdale Country Manor in Cavan Monaghan Township today. This will enable us to complete first doses in five of our eight local long-term care homes. We learned this morning that we can expect our next shipment of Moderna vaccine on Friday or Saturday, uh, and that we will have enough doses to allow us to complete the remaining long-term care homes early next week. I know we've been hearing a lot in the news lately about the COVID-19 variants, uh, such as the ones dubbed the UK or the South African variants, uh, collectively known as variants of concern. As of last Friday here in Peterborough, we have enhanced our management of all COVID cases and contacts. We have decreased our threshold for identifying contacts as being high risk. Um, we are also increasing the frequency of testing in high risk contacts with some now being tested twice during their isolation period. And we will be treating any symptomatic contacts as possible cases until proven otherwise. We are also uh, asking household members of high-risk contacts to stay at home except for essential purposes. Uh, we have not had a variant of concern identified yet in Peterborough, but we will advise the community if and when that occurs. We certainly will be looking very closely for it uh, whenever we have an outbreak in any of our high priority settings. I'd also like to update you on the reopening of our local schools. As you know, schools in the Peterborough area resumed in-person classes on January 25th, and our school health team has been supporting them with infection prevention and control measures. Uh, there are enhanced public health measures required in schools now, including the daily validation of screening by all uh, school staff and visitors. Uh, and for secondary school students, this will take effect on February the 10th. The other change is that students from grades one and up are now mandated to wear cloth masks uh, and that masks must be worn outdoors on school property if physical distancing cannot be maintained. As another example of how contact tracing continues to work in our community, we had a case last week connected with a local school, but because this person had been identified early and had isolated, there were no classroom cohorts impacted. We continue to remind all staff and students that if you are unwell, follow the recommendations to stay home and get tested. You won't know if it's just a cold until you have a negative COVID test. So that's it for me for now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salvatera. Uh, so now I would like to invite uh, our elected officials to, uh, to share any remarks they might have. And I'd like to uh, start with uh, Chief Carr from Hiawatha First Nation. And if you have a camera that you'd like me to spotlight, I'm happy to do that. Good afternoon, Brittany, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you again for allowing me this opportunity to say a few words. And I just wanted to touch on the piece of, that we see the numbers going down, and which is great news for our community but also the fact that we are still in a, a state of emergency and that the orders are still in place and especially the stay at home orders. And I know that we're all tired and especially I can't imagine, you know, the, the frontline workers and everyone that takes care of, of, of our community uh, citizens, how tired uh, you must be. And, uh, you know, I'm, think, I'm thankful for all that work that you do, but I wanna talk about our holistic wellness 
And when we talk about our holistic wellness, it's about the spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical well-being. And part of that, and part of our teachings with that come with that is that each of those areas, you know, we talk about the child, the youth, the adult, and the elder. And we need to be vigilant and take care of take care of honor and respect our sacred relationships with ourselves, our family, and our community. And we need to remember um, that we are not immune to this virus. And for many of our uh, First Nations people, we are prone to complications of this virus due to our high rates of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and, and we're already um, genetically at risk, at a higher risk. So I just ask and continue to ask that um, uh, not only our First Nation citizens, but also, uh, you know, the Peterborough County residents and and um, that you we all still work together to take care of each other. We are each other's neighbors, we're each other's family, we are each other's friends and that we do that. And, you know, we continue to follow the health measures and um, to keep and in, in place, in this in place, we'll keep our uh, families, ourselves, our communities safe and healthy. So, Chi miigwech for that and, and for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Carr, and thank you for continuing to support these uh, these weekly or biweekly media briefings. Um, okay, so now I would like to invite um, um, MP Monsef uh, to, sh to join us and um, hopefully you've got uh, your camera working and we can put you up on the screen. So go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Brittany. Hello, colleagues. Bonjour, Anin, Salam Alaikum from my home on Michisagi territory. As always, it's good to be on this call with such thoughtful leaders. Uh, Brittany, I'm going to focus my remarks today on three things, Black History Month, COVID variants, and news on vaccines. Uh, first and foremost, though, let me thank Dr. Salvatera and Board Chair Mayor Mitchell, Public Health, and every single person on the front lines of this work who's doing outstanding work, as Chief Carr said, probably exhausted, but still going because you care about the rest of us. We thank you. Given that this is our first conference in February, I do want to acknowledge that it's Black History Month. This year's theme is the future is now, and it's a call to action for all of us to build on the immense contributions that Black communities here in Peterborough, Kawartha, and in Canada have made to continue to make and recognize the transformative work that they're doing right now. It's also a reminder for us all to continue our efforts to combat racism and systemic racism in all their forms to build lasting equity that is informed by Black experiences. This year marks 25 years since the first celebration of Black History Month. It's a milestone achieved because of one of my predecessors, the Honorable Jean Augustine, the first Black woman member of parliament and the first Black woman cabinet minister in Canada. There are events happening virtually. If, if community members want to know what's going on and take part, the Community Race Relations Committee of Peterborough's website is full of events celebrating safely the contributions of Black Canadians to our, to our wonderful country. On COVID variants, uh, of course, the main priority is protecting the health and safety of all of us uh, and all Canadians. And in Peterborough, thanks to the efforts of public health and our residents, we've managed to slow the spread of COVID-19 and it's working, but we can't stop now. Actions that individuals are making, these actions that individuals are taking are making a world of difference. These new variants exist. Health Canada is monitoring their emergence and their transmission very closely. And of course, working with provinces and territories to better understand these new variants and their effects on transmissions. Lastly, I will speak to vaccines in the context of domestic biomanufacturing. Biomanufacturing being something that Peterborough has very proud roots in. There has been a Team Canada approach since the pandemic started 
on vaccination and response, and that's going to continue. Some of the best bright and brightest researchers and scientists in the world exist right here on Canadian soil. And existing can and in enhancing Canada's biomanufacturing capacity is part of our recovery plan. It's in Canada's interest now and in the future to have that biomanufacturing capacity right here at home. And that's why early on in the pandemic, we made immediate investments to support biomanufacturing opportunities here in Canada with Medicago, with Vido Intervac, the NRC, and Epsilera. We move, we move very quickly to expand vaccine manufacturing capacity across the country. And at the moment, there are three vaccine candidates who's, uh, who are going through regulatory approval with independent regulators within Health Canada. The Prime Minister announced today two companies, Precision Nanosystems and Novavax, are on track to manufacture vaccines here in Canada. This is a major step forward to get vaccines made in Canada for Canadians. And to begin, we've secured a memorandum of understanding with Novavax to produce their COVID-19 vaccine in Montreal. Pending Health Canada approval, of course, tens of millions of vaccines will be made right here at home. And we recognize that with Vido Intervac, we're, there are projects that will be able to produce up to 40 million doses annually. We're going to keep investing in the bi biomanufacturing sector for Canada's recovery and for the long term. And throughout the pandemic, of course, our objective has been clear. Prevent spread, come up with safe and effect effective vaccines and treatments, and work very hard to get our economy and our communities back to a new normal. I appreciate everybody's hard work to get us closer and closer to that day and look forward to rolling up my sleeves and getting a vaccine when it's my turn. Thank you very much, MP Monsef, and we, we are uh, very excited to hear that welcome news about local or, or domestic manufacture. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to invite uh, MPP Dave Smith, uh, if he's got some uh, remarks to share, so please go ahead, MPP Smith. Thanks, Brittany. I really appreciate that. Um, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen three different variants of the COVID-19 virus here in Ontario. The UK variant, the South African variant, and most recently the Brazilian variant. Uh, we don't have a great deal of information right now on the South African or the Brazilian, but what we do know with the UK variant is that it is much more transmissible, uh, up to 56% more transmissible. We have had uh, a drop in our infection numbers and it is looking very, very good in Ontario right now as they are coming down. Uh, we're seeing hospitalization stabilizing, we're seeing ICU cases stabilizing and the trend is, is starting to, to head in the downward path. So we're going in the right direction. It is great news about uh, a domestic supply of vaccines, but the reality is that's still a number of months away. And I, I'm looking forward to it. I don't want it to, to be a negative at all. It is something that is, is very good news for us, but we need to be diligent as we move forward. We need to continue taking the steps that we have been taking that are successful right now in reducing the spread of the virus. Uh, I know people are, are tired of hearing wash your hands and sanitize, but you need to wash your hands and sanitize. You need to disinfect. If you don't have to go out, don't go out. Take the opportunity right now to think about all of the other people that are and what you can do to protect them is to say the more we do that, the lower these numbers will get and the sooner we'll be able to get back to some normalcy in our lives. It's difficult. I get it. Stay positive, though, and test negative. Thank you. Thank you, MPP Smith, and reinforcing the need for diligence as we as we move through this. Um, OK, so uh, I, I also would like to now invite uh, Mayor Diane Terrian um, to say a few words. And if you've got your camera ready to go, otherwise we can uh, just keep it on this slide. Yeah, thanks, um, Brittany. I don't my home computer, unfortunately, isn't uh, camera compatible with Teams. Um, I don't have too much to add. I did want to uh, give a special thanks to Dr. Salvatera for um, 
coming to uh, our general committee meeting last night and updating council and the community on all the work that's being done on this front and on, on the vaccine front. Um, very much appreciated. I know that there was a lot of information and a lot of really good questions, um, but appreciate the work that uh, everybody at the health unit is doing in keeping not just council, but the community in general informed. Um, there's a lot of changing information as we know uh, and updates. So that was um, that was a really good presentation uh, at council last night. Other than that, I don't have too much to add that hasn't already been said. Um, just, you know, again, holding the line and uh, happy to answer any questions uh, at the end. OK, great. Thank you very much, Mayor Terry, and great to have you with us today. OK, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, County Warden Jones, if you have uh, any comments to share, please go ahead. Well, I'm certainly glad you said, but not least. Uh, <laughs> we certainly uh, are continuing down a positive road with the county. I bring greetings from from everyone. And I, I think all I really want to say today after everything else has been said is is thank you to everyone out there who's making a difference and who's working each and every day to, to help us through this. And that's all the, the good folks at the health unit. It's our MP, our MPP, everybody. And somebody else maybe who doesn't get uh, thanked a lot is the media for helping us spread the word. So I'll go now. Uh, Peterborough County is alive and well, and we're doing every, everything we can to help. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, great. So we've heard from all of our elected officials, and now we, have the, now we have the opportunity to hear to from hear. our um, um, media, media colleagues. Colleague. Sorry, I think we've got a, a mic still on, so there's a bit of an echo for me. Okay, so to start us off, uh, I'd like to uh, have Taylor Clydesdale. I believe you sent a few questions ahead of time, Taylor. So uh, you get to go first. So go ahead. Thank you. I think I'm only questions from Dr. Salvatera today. Um, just for Dr. Salvatera, I know at the um, uh, during your presentation to council last night, uh, you had said that uh, yesterday's vaccine shipment uh, did not arrive. Um, from the sounds of it, they, it is expected to arrive uh, this week or next week, did you say? So we have had confirmation this morning, Taylor, that the next shipment from Moderna will be arriving either Friday or Saturday. Okay. Um, what is the likelihood that, you know, we've been warned of, of, of vaccine supply delays. What's the likelihood that further shipments will uh, see similar delays? Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, just to note that the Moderna shipments are monthly. Um, so, um, and we will, uh, we're, we won't be scheduling our vaccine rollout into the last three long-term care homes uh, until, I, we're going to give it an extra day just because it has been uh, so unpredictable. So we'll start, uh, we're planning to start back up on the Monday and we hope to finish uh, by end of day Tuesday to get all eight of our long-term care homes finished. We've also uh, got some preliminary news this morning from the province that we can expect some Pfizer vaccine later this month. So we look forward to that as well. Okay. Um. Just in regards to with uh, cases in the area uh, uh, looking a bit more positive with the numbers looking a bit more positive lately, um, has there been any pressure from uh, businesses or from the community to kind of let the guard down a little bit and uh, uh, begin to ease some restrictions locally? Have there have been any compliance issues with the rules either? Well, I can certainly answer the latter part of your question as far as compliance. Uh, we have our inspectors here at Peter Public Health have uh, begun their own blitz of grocery stores and big box stores. Uh, we visited uh, 11 stores over the past weekend. And then during the week, uh, we will have uh, 19 additional stores that we uh, will inspect. Uh, so far, we're finding that our local business are for the most part taking the rec recommended and required actions um, but um, there are some areas for improvement uh, I think the the most common areas for improvement include uh, the uh, types of disinfectants 
that are being used and also the procedures for disinfecting equipment. Uh, some, certainly some of them are having issues with screening, um, whether they don't have adequate signage uh, at, uh, uh, for the public prior to entry. Um, we are also having to follow up with some who have not posted their uh, or monitor their capacity limits for their space. Uh, and we are also doing some additional work with some on their safety plans. So they're, they're working hard and trying hard, but I think there is room for improvement. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, just last question. Um, again, I, I feel like I am asking you to look into the crystal ball a little bit, but um, uh, with things going the way they are in Ontario, in Peterborough as well, uh, I believe it's February 11th that the stay-at-home order is expected to uh, uh, wrap up. Um, uh, can we expect that that will actually happen on that day, or do you think it might be extended again? Well, you know, a week is a long time in the life of a COVID pandemic, and so much can change. Uh, we've seen that before uh, over the past year. Uh, certainly, we're tracking well in Peterborough, but um, it, we know how powerful these new variants can be as far as uh, fueling another outbreak. So uh, we're waiting and watching. I, I have not heard whether the province will consider uh, going back to a regional approach again or whether it will stay as a united provincial approach and I certainly don't know yet I haven't heard any indications as to whether the uh, the stay-at-home order will be extended so I think we'll all have to wait and see okay perfect uh, I think that's it for me thank you so much Dr. Salter I appreciate your help today you're welcome Okay, thank you very much, Taylor. Uh, okay, um, let's uh, invite uh, Rob from Trent Radio. I see you're on the line joining us today. Do you have any questions for any of our speakers today, Rob? Uh, no, thanks. Nothing at this time. Okay, great. Okay, let's um, invite uh, Matt Latour then uh, from Oldies and Freak Radio. Hi, question for uh, Dr. Salvatera. I know between the first and second dose of the Pfizer vaccine, it has to be a minimum 21 days. Is there a maximum time you can go between getting your doses and uh, will any of the delays affect this? So the National uh, Advisory Committee on Immunizations for Canada has recommended that the maximum delay between doses be 42 days. Um, and I understand here in Ontario, um, our, our provincial recommendations now are that we not go beyond 35 days. So for those jurisdictions in Ontario where they are delivering their second dose to their healthcare workers, uh, they are using that 35 day as a maximum, um, but we are not delay delaying the second dose in for any of our long-term care residents. They are all uh, getting the second dose, depending on whether it's a Pfizer or Moderna, at the recommended time. And my next question had to do, I know the city kind of put out a public consultation about some of the modifications that were made downtown last summer. Would you suggest any kind of modifications compared to what we had last year that you think maybe would work better or maybe just some adjustments in general? Well, that's that's a great question. I think uh, the results of the consultation will actually show which uh, which of the measures uh, were successful and which ones will need tweaking. I'm just wondering if Mayor Therian would also like to answer that question. Thank you, Dr. Silvatera. Um, I would just say, yeah, again, because of the evolving situation, we're just gathering input on what uh, community community members liked or didn't like it, or where they think there could be improvements um, because we don't really know what things are going to look like in the, in the summer when uh, and when things open up again. So the the community survey is up. We do encourage people to fill it out as well as reach out to uh, city council with any suggestions that they that they have. Um, so that's pretty much all I can say about that at this point. Perfect. And my last question for Dr. Salvatera. 
Uh, just has to do with, I know last night you spoke to general committee about volunteers being needed for vaccinations and whatnot once they become more publicly available. Do you have any idea what kind of numbers you'll need as far as volunteers go and uh, what kind of spaces will be used for these? I think those details are being uh, determined as we speak, Matt. We do have a phase two working group that's busy meeting and identifying the venues that are appropriate uh, for that time of year when we are hoping to have mass immunization occurring throughout the city and also the county. Um, and as we build those sites and know how, how many immunizations we can do, uh, how many immunizations stations we can fit, uh, we will then be able to determine the numbers of additional volunteers that we will need. So right now, uh, I would just encourage anyone who would like to help out to go to our webpage and to click on the volunteer button and provide us with some information so that when we're ready, uh, we can come calling. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matt. And and just to clarify, the section on our website is under the career section, actually. That's where people can complete the form to volunteer for the mass immunization clinics. Okay, uh, let's hear from Joelle Kovach from the examiner. If you've got some questions, Joelle, go right ahead. Yeah, I do. From Dr. Salvatera. Um, if you are getting another shipment of the Moderna Friday or Saturday, it's it's meant to be enough for all the remaining long-term care residents so would that not be a that would be a much larger shipment than the first time would it not would it be like around no no because um we have about 1100 long-term care home residents in peterborough the first shipment was for 500 and we believe the second shipment will be for 600 so we will have enough to complete all of our residents and we will also have enough to do uh, some of the staff because when we're not allowed to move a punctured vial once it's been opened we have to deliver all those doses so we are doing some high priority staff as well and then we may be able to do some of the ALC patients who are currently in hospital but are waiting to go back into long term care homes or to be admitted into long term care homes. So we may, we need to make sure we also immunize them. Oh, I was thinking I think that that figure of 3000 people included the staff, right? And the essential yes. caregivers. OK, yes. that's why I'm confused. Yes. We're not things. doing we're not we don't have enough vaccine yet to do all of the staff. I'm I'm anticipating that we will have to wait until we get the Pfizer vaccine later in February in order to really go out and do all of the uh, long term care home and retirement home staff and caregivers. Oh, OK, thank you so much. That makes perfect sense. So Springdale must be quite small because it seems to me we'd only have about 52 or so left, right? That's correct. Okay, and so, okay. yes, we just have enough to get Springdale done. Okay, okay. Um, and I think I, I think you explained this and I would really love it. I, I, I Please indulge me if you could repeat this line that you mentioned earlier about there was a case connected to a school, but the cohort did not have to miss class. And you said, why not? And I don't think I caught it. Well, that's because that person who ended up being a case was identified originally as a high risk uh, contact. And because they isolated even before they got sick and were tested early, we identified them as a case and they hadn't been in school. So there was no impact on the school at all. That's that's the beauty of 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 timely case and contact management. When you can do it, you can actually be proactive and prevent additional exposures from occurring. Oh, I understand much better. In that case, because um, the person didn't go to school and there was no outbreak, can you name the school or can you not in that case? I wouldn't. I wouldn't name it. Uh, I I don't know what the Ministry of Education is doing. They have their own reporting system, but I have no public health reason to identify because there was no risk for that school. Okay, that's much appreciated. Thanks very much. I'm done. Great. Thank you, Joelle. Okay, I also see Paul Rellinger is here with us today. So, Paul, if you've got some questions, go right ahead. Uh, thanks so much, Brittany, and welcome back to the briefings. Um, good to have you back. Um, 
also for Dr. Salvatera, if I could, I was kind of hoping you would have seen your shadow today, Dr. Salvatera, and, and COVID would be over in six weeks, but I guess that's too much to ask. Um, <laughs> I had some questions uh, centered around uh, vaccination or clarifications, I guess. I read a report um, that I think it was in Nova Scotia that the Dentist Association has actually stepped forward as a group that that is interested in giving the vaccine. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you heard from any group like that here or can you tell us anything about that or who can give vaccines? Well, currently, um uh, certainly uh, physicians uh, and nurse practitioners can give vaccines. The province also um, amended the Regulated Health Professions Act uh, to allow nurses and pharmacists to give without a medical directive as long as they're part of a public health program. So we do have additional supports from our pharmacists and uh, nurses and, and RPNs. Uh, I am aware that uh, I've been told that there are conversations occurring at the provincial level uh, with dentists. Uh, and as you know, dentists inject into our gums. I hate to think of it, but that <laughs> does happen. Uh, and so, um, so those conversations are occurring as well. So I know we uh, want to have as many hands on deck as possible uh, once we do get that abundant supply of vaccine. Oh, thank you. And uh, regarding the variants, um, again, I, I, I saw in the news earlier this week or on the weekend that um, a variant was detected in Brent and, and they made it very clear that the case wasn't related to travel. And I'm wondering if you can just speak to that, because I think there's a, a, a belief out there that variants, if they're coming from UK or Brazil or South Africa, have to be related to travel. But that obviously isn't the case. Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, because these variants are now prevalent in many of these countries, one of the way they one of the ways that they will enter our community is through travel. And so you will have noted that there are now additional measures in place to restrict uh, travelers and uh, ensure that uh, they are tested and quarantined before they go about their business. So uh, that is one way. But um, we have community spread occurring of these variants, and that's because they were introduced at some point, maybe two or three or four cycles ago. And they now have uh, they've now been transmitted and they are circulating in our community. So we are still um, in the uh, we are still trying to contain them and trying to shut them down, which is what the stay at home order will allow us to do, as well as the enhanced measures that we are taking for case and contact management. We're trying to uh, stamp out the fire uh, before it gets out of control. Fortunate here to touch wood, not have a, a, a variant case locally, um, but just give us a sense of how much of a game changer that would be if we did. Well, we understand that they are more easily transmitted, about 56% higher transmission rates. So that means that you uh, don't require as much of an exposure. So right now, you know, we use two, two meters distance, uh, uh, 15 minutes as a cutoff, uh, the presence of masks. Once you have these variants, um, we will have more exposure occurring even under what we would have assumed to have been low risk. So more transmission, shorter incubation periods as well. So rather than waiting the five or six days before people are ill, these variants seem to act more quickly. People are then pre they're incub they're pre symptomatic and shedding virus faster sooner, uh, and and that uh, again adds to their transmissibility. There's some concern as well that they are leading to more uh, serious illness. There's been a report from the UK. It hasn't been replicated yet uh, in other jurisdictions, but certainly there is concern that. Uh, not only will they cause more disease, but that the disease will be more severe. So for all these reasons, we are very concerned about these variants. Oh, one last thing, Paul, I would I would like to add is that there is some evidence that that we have what's called variant escape in that um, there are people being reinfected. 
So people who had COVID uh, once before are uh, encountering the variants and are becoming ill again. So currently now, anyone who is reinfected with COVID is being tested for the variant. And of course, the concern is that the vaccines won't work as well. Uh, and we have some evidence of that from some of the vaccines. Uh, we have some uh, reassuring evidence from Moderna and Pfizer that they are responding to the variants, uh, but uh, with ongoing replication of the virus, uh, just as we've seen with influenza, uh, viruses mutate, and then you're into a situation where you're going to have to create new vaccines or, and, and boost people on a recurring uh, basis. So um, that is another scenario that we need to prepare ourselves for, and, and that is that we will need to have new formulations of our vaccines and potentially boost doses being provided to cover for those variants. Okay, thank you. I just had one more thing, and um, it's regarding the uh, the zones across Ontario. Now, we're all under the same measures right now. Um, if we're dropped to a, a lower zone, uh, or a better zone where there's less restrictions, obviously that would come from the province, from their direction. I'm just trying to get a sense of how much how much the province relies on your input in a decision like that? Uh, do they reach out to you? Or, uh, are you making them aware of the local numbers and, and, and pushing for better conditions as much as you can? Well, I, I don't need to make the province aware. They are aware. So the province is very closely monitoring all of the data and it is broken down by public health units so they can see. And, and I think a good example of that, Paul, would be the reopening of schools. So you will note that the reopening of schools has been gradual and it's been in response to those indicators that have shown certain communities having lower incidence rates and, and certainly uh, being more uh, prepared to welcome children and students back into the classroom. Now, in the case of the opening of schools, the Chief Medical Officer of Health did reach out to all of the local medical officers of health to seek our input uh, prior to making his recommendation to Cabinet. But it is a Cabinet decision. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, they are looking at all of the data very closely. Thank you. And, and and I just wanted to clarify one thing. I think last uh, briefing, it was mentioned that the vaccine stats would be posted uh, on the site uh, and updated each Friday. Uh, if that's happened, I can't find them on there or is it still pending? Uh, Brittany, would you like to take that one? I, I can answer that. Um, the, we just have to add the link, Paul, but the information with current vaccine status is um, added under our COVID vaccine page, uh, but I will um, have a, a link added to the, uh, the regular page for cases and status so that you can find it easily as well. Uh, thank you, Brittany. These old eyes miss a lot of things sometimes. So. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, there's lots of information on there, and I and I see my colleague has just provided uh, the the hyperlink as well, so you can find it that way. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, okay. So now, uh, Jessica Nisnik from Global. If you've got some questions, please go ahead. I do. Thanks, Brittany. Um, I have a quite a few questions, and then just some. Um, clarifications. The 35 days, Dr. Salvatera, and the 42 days. Mm -hmm. So it was originally that we could go for 42 days. Now it's recommended 35. Is that just for the Moderna or for the Pfizer as well? So that's, um, uh, that, that is a provincial recommendation. And I believe, uh, I, Jessica, I'm going to have to check to see whether it applies for both. I think it does apply for both vaccines, and it's only being applied to healthcare workers. It's not being applied for residents. Okay, thanks. So, if we're, you're, I'm guessing, you know, we hope to get the vaccine this weekend. So that would mean your team um, is looking to finish those last four homes or three homes, if you have enough for that one, next week. Yes, we are. Um, we will go into the homes uh, beginning Monday again. Uh, we just want to uh, provide a little bit of uh, wiggle room in case the vaccine doesn't get here until Sunday. Uh, so, uh, but we'll be prepared to go as of Monday. 
Thank you. And I think before you had said that Public Health Ontario would notify the health unit here and they notify health units if we get the variant in this yes. area. Um, it, that's correct. And where is the closest closest variant right now? Uh, I would have to look at the list. I know Peterborough is not on it. I'm not sure if Durham has had one yet. I know Simcoe Muskoka, which is just to the north of us, definitely has. Uh, so again, I'll have to check to see, but I, I do believe uh, Durham may have had one, but I'll double check on that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I knew. I think Durham had one a while ago. I didn't know if it was still around. And I believe you said you're not sure what system will go to the Ontario uh, system, like if we'll go back to color codes or, or whatnot. That hasn't been discussed yet. No, that has not been discussed. Not okay. with us. And then... <laughs> Um, lastly, how long do you think this business blitz will last or the big box or grocery store? How long does uh, the inspectors, how long do they plan to do it? And is there um, intention to start doing other businesses such as, as retail? Yes, so our inspectors will be out this week and we'll complete our blitz, but we have invited the Ministry of Labour and they will be coming to Peterborough uh, later this month to do a, a large blitz as well. But we will be providing the community with lots of notice uh, and information. I believe retail is on that list as well as potentially fitness centers. Uh, but you will hear more about that before our guests arrive. Excellent, thank you. Now, I um, my next questions are, are for something else, another story that Mark is working on mm -hmm. um, regarding opioid deaths. So I don't know if we need to keep everyone else or if you just want me to go ahead and ask that now. What what would you prefer, Dr. Salvatera or Brittany? I'm okay if you want to ask. Yeah, go, go okay. ahead, Jessica. Okay. I just have to pull these up here. So do we know how many deaths have occurred, a drug related or drug suspected deaths so far this year? We do, we, we do, we do and we don't. Jessica, because we um, are uh, counting uh, data from our local first responders and hospital, and um, it, and we are um, we are what we are suspect we we are counting the suspected drug poisonings. We don't have confirmation that comes from the coroner, and it takes often several months to get a confirmation. So the data that we are collecting is considered to be um, preliminary data and it can change once we get more information from the coroner. Okay, because I think last year you would say suspected even if you hadn't had confirmation from the coroner. That's correct. We, we were uh, reporting suspected uh, poisonings. The um, the partners who are involved in the local surveillance, so that would be again our first responders, our police, our hospital, uh, and ourselves, have uh, decided that they would use that data for internal purposes only right now. So that data is being shared confidentially with partners, and we are using it as a way to uh, ramp up or ramp down our harm reduction and our prevention efforts. OK, so that these questions point blank are wondering if the health unit will change its position and start releasing the numbers to show that the opioid crisis is still a very major issue while well, we deal with the tell, pandemic. I can tell you, Jessica, that the opioid crisis or the crisis in drug poisoning deaths, because it's not it's not just in opioids. I mean, the problem is that the illicit drug supply has been contaminated by uh, some of these opioids like fentanyl or, or, or similar analogs. Uh, so the whole, whether someone is using cocaine or using other drugs, no one can really be sure right now if it's an illicit product, whether it's uh, going to kill them. The, that's, the, that's the situation. So the crisis continues and we are doing everything we can from our perspective to warn the community, to, um, to encourage people not to use alone, to test their drugs, to, to even if they can't 
have someone present with them to call. There's now a number you can call so that you have someone on the line with you in case you don't, uh, you, you, you don't recover. Um, uh, so we're doing what we can, but, but uh, this does require efforts both at the provincial and federal levels of government to address the, uh, the drug supply to ensure that there is a safer supply, to ensure that people uh, who are uh, addicted to drugs are getting the help and the treatment that they require in order to keep them safe. Okay, thank you. And I know you're not the lead on this, but just the last question, has there been any progress in the harm reduction site um, getting going and have we heard anything from the province? I have not heard that uh, uh, that whether it's been approved or not. So that's our uh, our treat our consumption and treatment site. I don't know whether uh, MPP Smith has any news to add to that. Not at this point. I don't. Okay. So I think we're waiting to hear uh, Jessica. Okay. Thank you very much. And. I appreciate you uh, switching your hat there for a minute to your other crisis that you're dealing with. So thank you. That's you're it welcome. for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I see that uh, Joelle has her hand up. So if you have a question, Joelle, uh, please go ahead and ask it. Okay, so my question is, does this mean that that data about suspected um, uh, drug poisonings uh, won't be available from anyone like have it won't come from police either? That would be my understanding, Joelle, but I will have to look into it uh, to see what the implications are. We can, I can do that and we'll get back to you. And can you explain again why the public uh, is not being told about these suspected deaths? Um, this was a decision that was made by the partners uh, and again, we can get some background on that for you as well. Okay. Okay, so I, I think you're, I assume you're done, Joelle. Great. All right. Well, um, that brings us to the end of today's uh, biweekly media briefing. Thank you so much. I'd like to echo County Warden's um, support of and appreciation of the media for joining us so consistently for these over the weeks. And we will see you back here again on Friday. Okay. Have a great, uh, a great day, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you. Thank you.